All right, welcome back. This is CSIS 2200, Systems Analysis and Design. We're going to carry on with chapter number six, which is entitled Data Communications. And this chapter is a very important, like all the other ones, because it really kind of instills the concepts behind how data is transferred from one location to another, which is what we do all the time when we're on the internet, when we use cell phones, when we use any managing information system. So very important to understand the terminology and the concepts in this course. We're going to carry on and we're going to talk about some of the applications of data communication systems and what that involved components and different parts of the data communication system. We'll look at types of processing configuration. We'll look at topologies, some of the concepts like bandwidth, uh, understanding clearly the relationship between a client server model, uh, wireless and wireless security. We've talked a bit about wireless security in the security chapter, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as it pertains to data communications. The electronic transfer of data from one location to another. How does data transmit? Specifically, it, with the managing information system, how does the information get delivered and how does that information get delivered um, to the right people at the right time, that type of thing? Improve the, the flexibility of data uh, collection and transmission, and so on. I'll let you guys read through this. There's quite a few of objectives that we're going to talk about in data communications. Um, E-collaboration, uh, which we've been doing a lot with, with uh, a lot of this lockdown and, and working from home now. Virtual organizations. Uh, what does that mean? What's the difference between virtual and brick and mortar? All right, we'll, we'll carry on. We'll look at some examples, even like how websites send their information. How do you request information and understanding that at a basic understanding? How do emails transfer? How is it asynchronous compared to synchronous uh, file transfers? Lots of, of concepts here in this particular chapter. Um, we'll look at some online training examples, which we most of you probably um, have seen lots of this as we're doing a lot of this uh, right now in Douglas. Uh, how do internet searches work? Um, and the list goes on and on. So you guys are sitting there probably on your computer right now and you're using all sorts of applications and every pretty, pretty much every single one of these applications relies on some kind of data communications connecting you to some server out there. So you are essentially a client uh, accessing all these different types of systems out there, whether it's configuring, whether it's some kind of a geographical mapping program, whether it's some kind of more information. Oh, there's the mapping. Your email. I'm not sure this is a basket. Uh, if that's for food shopping and this is for consumers, your banking, et cetera. You guys know what we're talking about. We're using all these different inter communications. How does it work? You guys know how to use these systems, but it's important for students to understand a basic level of how data is actually transferred between these different systems. We are doing a lot more work at home. We're not going into school or into the office as much. So this is even more important nowadays to understand clearly how does data transfer? I mean, we can just say, well, we can ignore it and it doesn't work. But if we understand a bit more, we can help uh, become more efficient at the data. We can secure the data uh, and make it maybe even make it faster. You guys have probably been on a lot of uh, video calls, either using Zoom or Teams or Skype for Business. There's a lot of these different uh, conferencing tools out there. How is the data transferred compared to a file transfer? And there are differences between these. And how do you set these up? All right. Well, one of the first concepts that we need to know is bandwidth. Bandwidth, you guys hear this term all the time. If I asked you what your bandwidth is right now uh, with your internet service provider, with your internet, could you tell me? Uh, maybe you can, maybe you can't, uh, but bandwidth can be delivered in different uh, levels or a different amount of volume. And the metaphor here is you can have low bandwidth, which is like using a garden hose. You can only get so much water out of a garden hose with where you can get a large bandwidth or high bandwidth, which you could use like a fire hose and just get a tremendous amount of volume of data coming back and forth. So the, the, con the metaphor here is that, you know, you are, controlling the hose and then whatever you're spraying uh, or connecting to uh, is the is the server. So the client and the server relationship and it's the bandwidth. So very important. Uh, if you go into the Wikipedia site, it explains again further what bandwidth is. And what I would suggest that you guys do is you do a speed test. So just go to your browser, type in speed test and click on run the speed test. And this will tell you what your current bandwidth is on your 
uh, internet service provider. So my particular provider provides me at 20 to 25 megabits. Uh, they kind of sell it to me. I think believe they sell it to me at 20. My upload's a lot faster so I can transmit data to somebody a lot faster than I can receive the data. So there's what they call the upload and the download. And they are two different speeds. Now, if I test this again, uh, I could get different numbers each time I do this. And the reason because there's uh, when you're on the net and you're trying to connect, there are, you know, there's other traffic out there. There's more people out there surfing at, at that particular moment in time, and it could come back with slightly different results. So you can do this on your cell phone. You can do this on your internet service provider. And one th thing I'd suggest to students to check out is whatever they're selling you, that you should get that. So for example, I'm paying for a 20 megabit service because I think that's all I really need. I'm not a real big gamer or movie watcher. Uh, and even 20 uh, megabits per second is extremely fast. But you can up that. And I think with you know 5G, this goes up to 100 to, to 200 megabits uh, per second. So that would be one thing I would consider doing for your uh, bandwidth. So bandwidth is measured in different measurements. So this is an important term because people will ask you from time to time, what is your bandwidth or what is your data rate? Uh, because when you're communicating with a managing information system, you may have to transmit your information or your raw data to another system. And that's very important because we're talking about time. So these are key uh, numbers that you're going to, you should know, and you probably get quizzed on. The K is for kilobytes. Uh, so kilobits per second. So it's a bit of information per second, a million bits per second, a billion bits per second, or gigabit or a terabyte, which is a trillion bits per second, uh, are all how much. And if you think about that, that means that's a thousand on off switches every second that's being transmitted. Or if you get a terabyte, that's a trillion on off signals or bits of information that are transmitted per second. So an incredible amount of speed there. The next term is uh, attenuation, and this is a, uh, it's kind of a fun term. A lot of people don't really think of this. They just, they, a lot of people think, how many bars do you have? What's your, uh, your signal strength? Uh, what they're talking about there is that, uh, it's hard to see here, but that's the attenuation. And the attenuation is uh, how far away are you from the wireless bandwidth capability. So we see this a lot with our cell phones. So some people say, oh, I've got three bars. Next time you have a conversation with your friends, say, uh, oh, what's your attenuation? And they'll say, what? So then you say, well, that's your signal strength. <laughs> if you want to sound smart. Um, same thing with your Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi signal has these bars on it, and that's your attenuation. How far are you away from your maybe your router or your Wi-Fi access point? It's your attenuation. Next one is broadband. You hear this term uh, broadband and broadband is basically referring to multiple pieces of data that you can send at the same time. And if you're sending multiple pieces of data at the same time, you're gonna increase how fast your transmission rate is for that data. So you'll see that with um, um, RJ45 connectors, when you're using a twisted pair, uh, you get multiple uh, wires inside. So you, usually if you use TELUS, TELUS uses this, although TELUS has been moving over to a fiber optic, which has multiple lines, and they can pump multiple data through those lines and, and increase how much data you're getting and get a wider or broader band of, of data coming in, hence the name uh, broadband um, data. So a lot of times they'll, they'll even sell you, the internet service providers will say, hey, would you like to upgrade to your broadband, which could be a fiber optic broadband. It could be also a twisted pair. These are the different technologies that you can use with broadband. So you see the coaxial cables, the old telephone cable that you might remember. Uh, fiber optic is, of course, glass fibers, like hair-like fibers that can transmit multiple lines of data in. Then there's different uh, frequencies like your your Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi is using um, a, a hertz, usually a 300 to 300 hertz uh, radio transmission, short short range uh, to transmit that on multiple lines. It could have 30 to 50 hertz or twisted pair. Twisted pair is um, is your old telephone connectors. The RJ11 ports is the phone and RJ45 is the uh, internet or the um, the, the 
the local area network connectors. All right. Now they do have narrow band. This could be a term that you guys could end up um, reading a bit about. Narrow band is used for kind of specialized um, things where you don't want to have a broad base because it's very specialized. You'll see this with these uh, uh, personal, uh, they used to call these walkie talkies or uh, personal um, radios, and they use a very narrow band. So if you ever bought these, you can actually switch these over to a very specific band and anybody within range can actually hear on that band. So they're very common with uh, marine communications if you're on a boat and you wanna communicate, or if you just wanna have like a, a short range for let's say you're on motorcycles and you're riding with somebody, you can use this type of a, 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 of a communication or they call the narrow band, which is very different than the broad band. Now, a very important concept in data communications is something called the protocol. A protocol is basically uh, a set of rules, something that two parties agree to, to be able to communicate. So if you think about it, the language English is a protocol because we all agree to, to follow the rules of English and it's a protocol. When you're dealing with a data though, we don't need to be so elaborate as something like a language. We can have uh, rules that are a little simpler to, to communicate, but we do need rules. So we need rules around error detection. So what are some of the main components of a, a computer protocol is error detection. Means that if data is sent from one person to another person, there must be some kind of protocol in place that will check for errors. So making sure that the data that's being sent is actually received because there could be a corruption in the line. There could be some kind of degradation and you may not get it. Another rule to the protocol could be how long of a message do you want to send when you're talking to someone. You think about it in an English conversation, usually we talk, we let someone else to talk, you know, the other person talks, the other person talks. In a lecture situation like here, uh, you know, unfortunately the instructor gets to, to, to talk the whole time, but that's the protocol of a lecture. But if you're having casual conversation, the message length could be that you talk, the other person talks, and you try to have a relatively balanced amount. With computers, it's it's very precise. It's down to the bit. So they have a message length is a type of, pro, of um, one of the components or rules of the protocol. Transmission speed, how fast you want to transmit. Well, we kind of have, um, depending on the technology that you're using to transmit, the transmission speed would be defined inside of the protocol. Now, what are some examples of protocols? Now, you'll see, probably recognize some of these. There's a whole list of protocols. These are agreed upon rules. So you might have seen this one, Post Office Protocol 3, or this IMAP. This is another mail uh, protocol. All right, sorry, I got interrupted with my phone there. Um, so we were talking about the protocols, and we left off with this... Uh, this is a mail protocol. I forgot the, the acronym, what it stands for, but it's a uh, it's a more of a robust email protocol. Rules of transmitting emails. Most servers nowadays, email servers follow an IMAP server. Uh, there's this one here called the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. This is a, a, a protocol for servers that basically send out emails only. They don't receive. It's Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. This one here, you guys should recognize this. This is probably the most important uh, protocol of communications that we have on the planet. It's called Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This is very important to remember this one because most of our web surfing uh, occurs here. Uh, Timothy Berner Lee is the guy that came up with this and he was a, a researcher at the CERN Research Center and they, back in the, I think, 70s and they wanted to come up with a protocol method of being able to route data or simple hypertext in a hyper method to be able to transmit data from one computer to another computer. And that was, this is the protocol that changed, really changed the world. And from there, uh, we've also have the HTTPS, which is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, which is incorporating this protocol. This is a secure socket layer protocol. So when you guys are surfing the web, and I think I mentioned this before in other uh, videos, in the top corner here, uh, when you type in your account, you can type in HTTPS, for example, I just I was just at this website here, and then I go forward slash, and then I type in a, a website like CN Douglas College, and what that does is it creates a secure data connection, and you can see right here that it was, um, we, we've got it secured by a company here called DigiCert uh, is the name of the company that actually uh, 
sets the rules of the hypertext transfer protocol. So very important uh, concept because we're, you use this every single day and you should understand what it is. And if you're working for a company using a managing information system and transferring their information and their data, you have to make sure it is secured. So you would never transmit data in just a regular HTTP protocol because it doesn't have the security level. Now there's some older protocols like uh, Telnet, FTP, file transfer protocol or transfer component protocol for internet protocol. This protocol right here for internet protocol is a routing protocol on how to route your data. So there's a lot of protocols. I put a link here in from Wikipedia and when it opens up here, it shows you all the different protocols, I believe. Well, that's not it right there. Let me just uh, find it. Oh, that was it. I had put in a link here of different protocols. So there's the internet protocol. These are some terms that you guys should know and you will be tested on. File transfer protocol, because sometimes you're transferring files and what are the pros and cons, a little bit of the, the history of that. There's the secured socket uh, shell or the secured shell. There's a secured socket layer. This is an extra data layer. Uh, telnetting, simple tr uh, mail transfer protocol. There it is, post office protocol version three. Internet messaging access protocol. I always have to remember that one. Uh, and of course, the number one protocol right here, hypertext transfer protocol. And uh, nowadays, uh, Google pretty much doesn't run websites that don't have this on it right here. Um, if you don't have a, a protocol on it, it, it can give you a error message. Here's an, an example. I used to run uh, a server and this was a educational server for Microsoft, a uh, massive open online uh, digital learning environment. And uh, this is a website I used to run you know, years ago and I just basically forgot about it. It was just free courses on Microsoft Excel. And if you look up here, it says it's not secure. So that means that if you type in your information right here, your information is going to be compromised or could be compromised. This site has been hacked many, many times because they know pe uh, people go out, they look for these unsecured sites and they look for this right here. And if I was to send this, transmit this information over line right now, hackers capture that and they have basically, they have administrative access to this website. So what they've done is, which is really interesting, is they've actually hijacked my site and they've put on their own ad choice. I didn't put this in. I didn't put this ad up here. I didn't put this ad. Somebody on the internet has captured my site and they're advertising. So if I click on this link right here, they're actually receiving some money for that. So it, amazing how something as not secure could run into such a long, uh, you know, can, can capture a site and cripple it and hold it captive. But the, the, whoever did this was not doing it to, to destroy my site. They wanna make money off my site. So they, they're actually just uh, advertising on it. So kind of an interesting thing if you don't have the right protocol. All right, let's talk a little bit about the hardware. So transmitting data requires hardware, obviously. And we've all used these types. This is the, not the Monera system, but you'll see this one. This is becoming very, very popular. It's very easy. I think it's called Clover. Uh, a friend of mine actually uses this in his business. Very easy, nice, easy to read screen. It's a tap and go, transmits the data. So there are a lot of different devices. This example up here is a, uh, a thin client, which is basically a, a, a computer, but it's the size of a, a, like, a, like a book. And it's got essential data communications ports in it. There's your network part, your RJ45 port, a couple of USB universal bus ports. We've got an old, uh, VGA port and some more USB 3 ports here, plus another uh, power plug on it right there. All right, so uh, these devices are obviously used for sending and receiving. All these computers are, are used for uh, inputting and outputting. So we input the data with a credit card and it outputs and processes it and transmits it wirelessly to the host and processes your, uh, your transaction. So the, the Citrix Thin Client, and Douglas College has one of these. In fact, if you guys want, uh, you can access this from home. This is a really cool thing. Open up a browser and just type in remote.douglascollege.ca. So if you guys type in remote.douglascollege.ca, you guys can act, use your uh, Chrome browser, your Safari browser, as a universal client to connect to the, your Douglas College computer and run a computer from Douglas College. Now, for some reason, it's taking a lot of time here for this to hook up. 
because uh, I use a different another system here uh, called Citrix, and it's a system that's used to do basically the same thing. Anyways, it's not loading right now, but you guys give it a try um, on my computer. I got too much stuff running on here, I think, right now. Um, they call it a smart terminal sometimes. They call it a thin client or smart terminal. Sometimes these terms are used synonymously. We do have a Citrix. I think I'm missing the letter T here. Um, so if you type in Citrix, uh, it's a the ability to be able to connect uh, remotely. Unfortunately, that's not working on my computer right now. So it's an intelligent uh, terminal, I guess you might. Oh, intelligent ter terminals are actually slightly different. These are ter terminals with a, a dedicated purpose. Um, you see these devices like workstations for personal computers. Um, you, if you ever got a Nexus card at the airport, they have uh, dedicated terminals. Or when you're going through your, the airport and you're doing a passport, and they're, it's to uh, basically take over someone's job. Uh, you'll see this in grocery stores. Uh, they've got the self-checkout, which is taking over someone's job. They used to do that for you. Now the terminal does it for you. Uh, these are called intelligent terminals. Now, notebook computers are computers that are based, they have usually have fairly low hardware requirements because the applications that they connect to, the services happen at the server end of it so you guys probably have seen these chromebooks out there they're very low cost you can get them for around 300 dollars uh, at costco and you can basically and they're quite quick because you can connect them to the google services and do most applications online now it's really not the best solution for a, a student because we need to have other software tools running. A, a PC would probably be bit better, but these are very low cost. I put a link in here, I think, to the Costco uh, version. For some reason, uh, all these links aren't working on my computer today for some reason. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll have to uh, figure out what, what's going on with that later, which is probably a good time to, to wrap up this video because uh, I'm already running out of my 22 minute time frame. So I'll carry this on with the next video.